All right, the next presenter we have is Alex Kell uh, from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, he's studying in the field of computational neuroscience, and his advisor is Josh McDermott. Um, he did his practicum at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in 2017. Uh, so today, he'll be presenting on uh, in invariant and hierarchical uh, computation in human auditory uh, cortex. All right, um, so uh, I'm Alex Kell. I'm a PhD student uh, at MIT uh, in Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Um, and today I'll tell you about my work exploring invariant and hierarchical computation in human auditory cortex. Uh, so from a pair of waveforms and pinging on your eardrums, you're able to extract a host of useful information about the world. Um, if a stimulus is speech or sound to speech, we're often able to infer uh, what was said and who said it. For non-speech sounds, we're able to infer um, what caused the sound oftentimes and where that sound may have occurred in the world. Uh, and what I'm interested in is how does the brain extract this behaviorally relevant information from these waveforms? This information is latent in the waveform. You have to go do a lot of processing to make it explicit. Um, in the very early stages of the auditory system, the, uh, the peripheral auditory system is relatively well characterized, uh, but auditory cortex is poorly understood. Um, and these are later stages of the auditory system. And this is particularly true in humans. So today I'll talk about our work addressing some basic fundamental questions about the functional organization of human auditory cortex. Uh, specifically we ask, is there a hierarchical organization to human auditory cortex? If so, how many stages might there be? And what might these different stages do? And, uh, and there's really a remarkable lack of consensus on many of these basic questions in human auditory cortex. And so I'll tell you about the progress that we made in addressing these questions. Uh, a priori, it's not really clear uh, what the different stages might be and what they might do. So rather than uh, asserting hypotheses or, or, or possibilities somewhat arbitrarily, um, we're going to build computational uh, models to generate specific hypotheses about what these different stages may be and what's occurring across them. And I had the pleasure of working with a bunch of these collaborators, uh, and this work was recently published. Um, so how can we build better models of the auditory system, and of auditory cortex in particular? Uh, you could imagine compiling a list of all the facts, of all the knowledge that we have about the auditory system, and trying to integrate that into a single coherent framework. Uh, but that's not at all what I'm going to do today. Instead, I'm going to take a different approach. Um, and as I noted at the beginning of the talk, um, our brain underlies a, our ability to do all sorts of different tasks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put aside everything that we actually know about the brain and just turn to engineering to make a model that does some of the things that we do. And then we'll treat that resulting model as a candidate model of the auditory system. Um, and we'll turn to recent advances in machine learning and what's becoming known as deep learning, um, as you guys have heard a lot about today um, and, and yesterday and probably know about before, um, where there have been improvements in training these artificial neural networks in the last few years. And so we'll use one class of neural network, a hierarchical convolutional neural network. And as many of you are aware, CNNs and deep learning have produced state-of-the-art uh, performance in many, many domains, including computer vision and automated speech recognition and many other uh, domains. They're like basically why, your, why Siri works now and didn't work five years ago. Um, the key hypothesis that we're pursuing in this work is that a model optimized to perform real-world tasks might converge to brain-like computations. And this approach has been pioneered in the visual cortex, um, where it's been shown that CNNs recapitulate aspects of the hierarchical structure of the ventral visual stream. Uh, and because the cortical regions and pathways in the visual system are relatively well established, the similarity has been taken um, as an effective way of validating this task-driven modeling approach that I'm talking about. Um, by contrast, given that less is known about the organization in the auditory system, we thought that this kind of approach may be particularly useful for addressing these basic fundamental questions about the functional organization in the, in the auditory system. Um, so there's a lot to be excited about uh, deep learning. Um, it can generate ar artificial systems that actually do some of the things that you and I do, um, as well as you and I can do them. But there are also a lot of things that are unsatisfying about deep learning models as a model for neuroscience. Um, and here are just a few. There are many, many more. Um, and just to zoom in on one, uh, deep learning models often require a huge amount of labeled training data, uh, likely much more labeled data than like you or I, as a child, needed to uh, uh, receive. Um, like you don't need 100,000 examples of the word dog to be able to discriminate the word dog from the word cat. Uh, you learn that much more quickly. These models take that order of, of training examples. Um, but with that being said, it seemed somewhat plausible that despite these very different methods of um, getting to a solution, 
maybe the brain, the, the resulting solution out of this procedure and the resulting solution out of development and evolution that occurs in our brain, they might converge on a somewhat similar um, result. And that's what we're going to explore today. So we trained our networks on two real world tasks um, that have these large labeled data sets. One was a word recognition task where we excerpted speech from these large labeled corpora and mixed them with real world background noise, uh, such as like a busy restaurant or a subway stop. Um, and the network received a two second clip and had to identify which word occurred in the middle of the clip. And this is out of a dictionary of about 600 possible words. The second task was a musical genre task. And the network had to recognize which uh, clip a given, uh, which genre a given clip was drawn from. And we excerpted the music from these labeled corpora. And so we found a network architecture that performed either the word or the genre task well separately. And then we sought to create a unified single network that would perform both tasks by merging these two task-specific networks. And we did this uh, because we wanted to have one candidate model the auditory system. Our auditory system underlies a bunch of our ability to do a bunch of different tasks, and so we wanted a single model that could kind of recapitulate some of those behaviors. So we enumerated all the possible amounts of processing that would be shared across these two tasks. And on one extreme, you could um, imagine that you don't actually share any processing at all. Uh, you just have the input, and then you'd have one stream for word and one stream for genre. <clears throat> um, by contrast, you can imagine that nearly all the processing is shared. So you're sharing all the processing all the way up until final stage where you do word classification here and genre classification here. And of course, you can imagine something in between where you're sharing like, about half the processing, then branching off where you have a genre specific or a word specific task and then a genre specific task, or word specific branch and a genre specific branch. And it's worth noting that this fully separate model at the top has basically twice as many parameters as this uh, fully shared model down here. And based on the notion that sharing as much as possible uh, might be optimal, we're going to, uh, we're going to select which network. Um, by asking how many layers can we share without uh, taking detriment in task performance. And this is the idea that if um, sharing as much as possible might be optimal given, under, given some resource constraint like the number of units, or like the number of neurons in your brain. Uh, so we're enumerating all these branchable branches with, uh, or branch points with trainable parameters. Here are different branch points here. So if you're sharing almost everything, you're over here. If you're sharing very little, you're over here. The y-axis is a proportion of words correctly identified by the network. Um, and as a baseline in gray, I'll plot the, uh, the fully separate network that I mentioned before. Uh, and what we see is that we can share about halfway. Uh, we can share about half the uh, network before we really take a hit in performance. We basically see no detriment before we get up to about halfway. And so we'll use this half shared uh, network as our model. And here I'm showing only the results for the word, uh, the word task, but you see similar results for the genre task as well. So here's our resulting network where we're sharing these first few stages. Uh, before branching into two task-specific pathways. And this is really an innovation of the project, is that we're doing this multitask pathway learning. And you can imagine uh, this kind of approach being a useful tool to generate uh, hypotheses about the functional organization, both the segregation and integration of processing uh, in the brain. So like, if we added other tasks, like, war like a speaker identification or sound localization, where might these things branch off? And what might that suggest about how information processing is, is organized in the brain? OK, so we've arrived at this candidate model uh, that's been trained to perform these tasks. And before comparing the internals of the model to the brain, let's first look at how the model's input-output mapping compares to that of humans. That is, how does the model's behavior compare to the human behavior? So we're going to examine uh, human behavior uh, in the same task that the network was trained on, uh, this word recognition task. And we'll examine the performance in 26 different conditions, five different background types um, listed down here, and five different signal-to-noise ratios. And then the plus one for uh, like clean, noiseless speech. Um, and so this y-axis, uh, or this x-axis is going to show the signal-to-noise ratio. More noisy will be on the left. More, more, less noisy will be on the right. And the totally clean will be right here. Um, the y-axis is a proportion of words correctly identified. And you can see that humans find word recognition music to be relatively easy. That line is up here. Whereas word recognition speech babble to be relatively more difficult. And when we look at the network performance on the exact same stimuli and the exact same task, uh, this is what we see. And there are two key things to note. Uh, first is that basically all of the points on the left or on the right here are higher than the corresponding points on the left. That means that this artificial network is performing the task at least as well as humans, humans are doing. 
Um, and this is really, this is illustrating the point that I mentioned before, but this is one reason why people are excited about this model um, or about deep learning for, uh, for neuroscience, is we actually are able to build things that do things that do real world tasks as well as you and I do, which is something we never had before in the, in the history of systems neuroscience. Um, and the second thing to note about this is that the pattern across these two plots is relatively similar. Um, so the network also finds word recognition and music to be relatively easy and in, in speech babble to be relatively difficult. And I just want to emphasize that the CNN was not optimized to match um, human behavior. It was only optimized for the task. And so we're trying to understand what the similarity might mean. And there are two main possibilities. One is that the, both uh, the network and the humans are, are near optimal, given the kind of constraints of the task. So they're both hitting up against performance limits, which would mean any system that performs as well as humans would exhibit a similar pattern of errors. Another possibility is that this model is a neural network, and so maybe there are some algorithmic similarities here, uh, which would mean that other very different models uh, uh, might exhibit a very different pattern of performance while exhibiting the same overall level of performance. But we don't really have alternatives, uh, given that deep learning is kind of the only game in town to get good performance. Uh, so hopefully this will change over the next few, few years or few decades, and we'll be able to answer these kinds of questions. OK. So given the similarity between the network output and human behavior, we next compared the internals by using this model to predict cortical responses to natural sounds. And we measured fMRI responses to a broad set of natural sounds, the sounds that you often hear in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and I'd like to note that about a, th a third of these sounds are speech or music, uh, but, a th but about two-thirds are not. Um, so this, um, this is a very broad kind of sample of auditory cortex in general, not just speech and music, which the network was trained on. So this is kind of a strong test. Uh, so for each voxel, we'll measure its mean response. We'll present each of these 165 sounds to a human in the fMRI machine, a measure of voxel of three-dimensional pixels, response to each of these sounds, and take the average. And then we'll take the same sounds, present them to the network, and in a given layer, we'll extract each model unit's response to each of these sounds. And then we'll treat the CNN in what's known as an encoding model, where we'll model each voxel as a weighted sum of the units in a given layer. And we'll use cross-validated regularized linear regression to predict this voxel response from, uh, from this layer. And you can basically think of this as trying to align the representational space of the layer as best as possible with that of the voxel without nonlinearly distorting uh, the representation in the layer. And our dependent measure out of this process will be uh, cross-validated uh, variance explained. And we'll perform the identical procedure with um, spectrotemporal filter model, which is a relatively standard model of auditory cortex. OK, so how well does our task-optimized CNN predict cortical responses? This x-axis indicates uh, the layers in our network. Um, the y-axis indicates the proportion of variance explained, the median across all of auditory cortex. So if it were perfect, it would be at 1. Um, and gray here is, this, is the spectrotemporal model. This is our baseline. It's explaining about a little more than half the variance. And here's what we see for, here's what we see for our network, uh, where the layers um, are predicting auditory cortical responses substantially better than the spectrotemporal filter model. Um, and you may wonder whether this improvement is due simply to the number of, uh, number of features in these neural network layers or the amount of nonlinear computation in these different layers. So we can also look at the prediction quality uh, for an identical network, but with untrained random filters. And, uh, and we see that we get this, this network does substantially worse, and it does even worse than the spectrotemporal filter model. Uh, so it suggests that task optimization was really necessary to get this high quality prediction out of, this, out of the system. And you can also see uh, for the train network that these very early and very late layers are actually doing worse than the spectrotemporal filter model. And we're not totally sure what's going on here, but this is consistent with the idea that maybe these earlier layers are, um, are more like subcortical, earlier stages of the processing system that we're not actually uh, examining. And maybe these later layers um, are consistent with uh, processing that might be happening outside of auditory cortex, maybe in frontal cortex or in parietal cortex. Um, and future work could kind of examine, follow up on this and examine these kinds of questions. OK, so we have a more predictive model of auditory cortex. Um, in and of itself, I'd consider that a success, given that a goal as a science is to predict things. Um, but it also seems possible that we could glean some additional understanding from such a model. Uh, and one outstanding question is, what is the organization of human auditory cortex outside of primary areas? And one proposal uh, comes from macaque anatomy. Macaques are kind of uh, a, a common um, model animal um, that's, a, that's a monkey. Um, and there's anatomical evidence, that's, there's structural evidence of a tripartite hierarchical organization um, where there's a first stage of processing in the core, second stage, secondary processing in the so-called belt, third stage of processing in the so-called parabelt. 
Um, and the evidence is, is, is mostly anatomical. Um, and it's unclear the extent to which this really applies in humans, given differences between species. So we're going to we're going to use this network to get a measure of hierarchy. Um, specifically, we're going to uh, see which layer best predicts each voxel response. Um, and the idea is that these earlier layers are closer to the input, and so there's uh, there's less linear nonlinear computation here, whereas these later layers are closer to the output, the task classification. So they might be a little more abstracted, and there um, there's more nonlinear computation. So when we look at the best predicting network layer for each voxel, um, we're going to look at this on this, this map right here, which is an inflated view of, of a human brain. So uh, brain is curled up in your skull. The light gray are the things that you would actually be, see, be able to see when it was curled up. The dark gray are the things that you couldn't. So that's why we inflated it. Um, this white outline here, so this is the front. The front is here. The back is here. Um, the, this white outline here is anatomically defined, so structurally defined primary areas from a bunch of dead brains like 20 years ago. Um, and what I'll do is I'll label each voxel with how well it's predict or which layer best predicts it. Um, if an intermediate or early layer best predicts it, it'll be shaded pink. If a later layer best predicts it, I'll, I'll shade it blue. Here's what we see. Non-primary areas are largely blue, and these primary areas are largely pink. Um, and this kind of best layer map suggests and illustrates a potential hierarchical organization of human auditory cortex. So in summary, um, I introduced these multitask networks as neural models. I showed that they perform as well as humans and exhibit a similar pattern of errors. And I showed that they reveal a hierarchical organization in the human auditory cortex. Um, I want to thank uh, my, my advisor, a key collaborator, um, and a talented undergrad who worked with me, as well as the CSGF. Uh, for funding me for these four years. Thank you.